We are um, going to have a kind of panel discussion this evening um, led by Sharon Monteith, who's from the Center for Research into Race and Rights at the University of Nottingham. This is a new center with whom we are collaborating at um, Nottingham Contemporary through our research strand, among others. And she will introduce David and Marquise, who are also going to make really important contributions tonight. Um, I think this is probably going to be the first conversation around critical whiteness, but to be followed up by others. And um, I just wanted to point out two things in the program program that are taking place in the next month that are going to touch on some of the issues. So if, if um, you know, there are discussions that you want to continue, I would highly recommend coming uh, to the events on June the 2nd, which is um, a performance of a younger generation of artists and thinkers responding to Horace Ove's very important film on um, called Baldwin's Nigger, which was on James Baldwin's, one of his first appearances in the United Kingdom um, and his interactions with the um, West Indian Student Centre in London. And I think um, the second is a, a, a session that's going to be run by Sonia Dyer, who is here on the 10th of June. Sonia's here somewhere in the audience. And that's going to be on intersectional politics. So I invite you back to those two events, but also um, invite you to participate actively this evening. We're, we're happy that you're here, and this is meant to be a, <clears throat> a dialogue as much as a series of presentations. And after this evening's event, we also invite you to join us in the bar to continue on. So without further um, chatter, I will hand you over <laughs> to Sharon Monty uh, and our panel this evening. Thank you, Jana. Um, this event was um, inspired by Glenn Ligon's exhibition, Encounters and Collisions, and the conversation that Jana and I had about critical whiteness. And it unites Nottingham Contemporary with the Center for Research in Race and Rights. Um, I'm Sharon Monteith. Um, I work predominantly on the US South, but race and social justice and history and memory more broadly. And I co-direct the center with Professor Zoe Trott. And it's my pleasure to welcome our guests today. Um, Marquise McFerguson is a poet, a performer, a teacher, activist. He's the founder of Art Can Change the World, which is a foundation that works very hard to think about the ways in which art can alter the world in terms of th making us think about social justice and also the multiple forms of discrimination. So he's a, a poet, a performer, and he's going to include two poems for us tonight um, as part of the performance, as well as joining in and contributing to the discussion overall. My next guest is David Rodiger, um, Professor of American Studies from Kansas, and Dave has been at the forefront of critical whiteness studies across, well, three decades. And um, thinking about his work, he's published um, Race and the Making, Wages of Whiteness, Race and the Making of uh, the American Working Class. That was 1991. And in 1994, he published a book tellingly called Towards the Abolition of Whiteness. And in that book, he said, one of the things he said, whiteness describes not a culture, but precisely the absence of culture. It is the empty and therefore terrifying attempt to build an identity based on what one isn't and whom one can hold back. And I went back to that particular quotation in 2009 um, when I was listening to Glenn Beck, then of Fox News, say that um, President Obama um, evidenced a hatred of white culture. And he was asked how he might account for that. And he said, I don't know how to answer that in a way that's not a trap, you know. You know what I mean? And in a sense, what critical whiteness studies has been doing, and Dave's work in particular, is springing that trap and helping us to think about what whiteness really does mean. So the US nation's attempt to be white um, has been going on since 1619, really, in the Virginia ruling against interracial marriage. Um, 1790, naturalization of citizenship for whites of good character. And what David does is he traces all that in his books. Um, the Wages of Whiteness, Coloured White, Transcending the Racial Past. Perhaps a good place to start with his work, if you've not delved into it yet, is the book How Race Survived U.S. History, Settlement and Slavery, 
from settlement and slavery to the Obama phenomenon. And it's a distillation of many of the ideas. So we're going to tell you some stories about whiteness tonight. We're going to talk about that history. We couldn't do so without talking about racism, which is so central to that history. And because of the, um, the exhibition, we thought we'd begin with three or four images to talk about before David is going to map the field of whiteness studies for you. Then I'm going to come in for a spell, maybe talk a bit about the UK. Marquise is going to frame our discussion by bringing poetry and images back into the frame before we open up that discussion to you all. So this is one of the images that Glenn Ligon produced, but not one that's in the exhibition. Um, it's based on an essay that Zora Neale Hurston, the African-American novelist, wrote in 1928, How It Feels to Be Coloured Me. And I think one of the things we're trying to do today is to throw whiteness against a sharp background, in other words, to sharpen the ways that we think about it. Growing up in an all-black town, Hurston didn't think of herself as coloured, as she put it. Um, she thought of herself as a person. White people were the people who didn't live in the town, they drove through it. But as soon as she got to Jacksonville, she started to feel um, coloured. And she felt discrimination and said that, you know, she really didn't, it didn't upset her too much because she always wondered why those people would choose not to be in her company when her own company was so fascinating. So it's one of the ways that she coped with that image. <clears throat> Talking of being in company. This is Adrian Piper's image, which Marquise and I were looking at earlier today. Yeah. 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 Can I read this for you? Uh, Dear friend, I am black. I am sure you did not realize this when you may slash laughed at slash agreed with that racist remark. In the past, I have attempted to alert white people to my racial identity in advance. Unfortunately, this invariably causes them to react to me as pushy, manipulative, or socially inappropriate. Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks even when they believe there are no black people present and to distribute this card when they do. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. Thank you. <laughs> no, really. These, I, I guess, um, I just say that, that Adrian carries this over with such grace that it's possible to miss how costly this is that for, has been for her. She did the art for one of my books and, and uh, at the time she was becoming uh, very concerned with her own health and with keeping young artists and particularly young artists of color healthy. And so, you know, sometimes you read Baldwin and it's so um, beautifully rendered that, and this is so clever as a kind of performance piece that it's possible to miss that these things have a tremendous, tremendous cost. And in Adrian's case, over a very long, uh, period of time and in different institutions. Uh, and in some ways, I think it it's, uh, made her uh, less eager to talk about race at this stage of her life than she was at other uh, stages of, of her life. So it's a, it's a brilliant intervention, but also a costly situation. We move in a completely different direction with another that Glenn Ligon put in the exhibition, Giovanni Anselmo, Invisibile. And in this performance piece, throwing a light on his own whiteness and projecting it and making that visible in the way that um, Arte Povera in, in Italy 
in the 1960s and 70s began to do. And that hand, I mean, obviously, iconically, it's the black power fist, isn't it? Mm. But this button is um, from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and we've, we've all been talking a little bit about them. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything about this one. Actually, um, this is an iconic button from the Congress of Industrial Organizations originally in the United States, the black and white fist and, and uh, our hand clasp. And C.L.R. James, the great English and Trinidadian and United Statesian intellectual, uh, wrote about that button and that sentiment to say it's... Um, not really quite enough it, 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 that black and white unite and fight is a unimpeachable he said but also not enough and what he meant was that often then uh in the service of that slogan uh specifically race-based uh grievances got erased but here snick uses essentially the same iconography in the service of a black-led Organization. So I think one of the things we could talk about maybe later tonight is um, what in the Ferguson Black Lives Matter movement is being called allyship on the part of whites and how solidarity actually works and how important it is that solidarity doesn't take the form of some kind of a facing of white supremacy, that it actually confronts white supremacy. So this actually is not that comforting an image mm. as a SNCC image, I think, as it was as a CIO uh, image. That's interesting, because to me, I think, I feel that SNCC was probably the most radical of these civil rights organizations yeah. in the 60s, and that what they were trying to do in the Deep South, in Mississippi in particular, was they were living on an island of integration in a, in a sea of segregation. In other words, trying to, to live interracial activist lives. And yeah. I think one of the things that's intriguing is when SNCC activists who were white, um, particularly somebody like Bob Zellner, who was the first of the, of the core activists, was seen as no longer white by some of the black activists. So. Mm -hmm. You know, James Foreman could say that. And, you know, the history of the race traitor is maybe something that we will come on to in our discussion as well. And, you know, and how that um, has changed over the years. One more before um, David gives us our overview of critical whiteness. And... Um, This is Danny Lyon, who was SNCC's first photographer, New York Jew, went down to Albany, Georgia in 1962. This is one of the first photographs he ever took. And I think one of the reasons for us looking at it is that if you're going to make an ideology like white supremacy understandable to those people to whom these photographs were going to be communicated, you need to make it visible. And here he does this and the seat of justice is the broken down small colored water fountain and the clean sparkling white one next to a kind of chair of justice which you can just see there peeking into the frame on the right so these are are some of the images that we started to think about to do with whiteness and to make it visible as we thought about the exhibition. But Dave, you want to stand up for your... Yeah, um, I think I will, yeah. if I can get some light. Well, what we thought David would do is to talk to you about critical whiteness as a field and a kind of the potted history from the expert, really, to, to kick our discussion off. Um, thanks, and thanks everybody that put this together um, at the museum and at the university. Um, that's a, great to be on this particular panel. It's great that people would come out in the U.S. Nobody would come out at dinner time for a talk, so it's nice to see so many uh, people here. This is being uh, 
live streamed to Australia to a radio station, so that's uh, very impressive, and uh, it's a good night. And a wonderful exhibit, uh, so thanks also to the Nottingham Contemporary for the, for the exhibit um, itself. I want to begin with um, a little bit of writing uh, from a, almost exactly a century ago uh, by the greatest United States intellectual um, of the 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who was trying to really figure out uh, what the connections of race and empire and whiteness and World War I were. And he was writing African Roots of War, but he was also writing these essays about what whiteness is. And, and um, after just 20 years before, having very conventional views about the kind of biological reality of race, he writes in 1915 that um, personal whiteness, he says in quotes, is a very modern thing, quote, a very modern thing. Thing. And then he tries to actually figure out how modern, and he says it's about 250 years old now, so it would be 350 years old now. So what Du Bois was doing, he just founded the NAACP, he just led some John Brown uh, commemorations. Uh, one of the things that he was trying to do was to make whiteness an object of study that we'd have to think about what, when was whiteness, where does it come from, and when was it. And remarkably, if you do the math and take it back, the 250 years before um, 1915, you get right to this series of interracial rebellions in Virginia and Maryland in the US, uh, what becomes the United States, uh, that historians now actually say was the critical turning point toward the solidificate the turn to of rulers in those colonies to making people think they were white so that they would be loyal to the colonial project and hostile to African uh, labor. So in one way, it's a tremendous uh, marking of how far ahead of all of us Du Bois was in almost every conceivable way. But in another way, it's also a little bit of a signal that some of the critical study of whiteness, we should be uh, willing to say maybe this is a little bit too United States centered, that the, uh, the notion that whiteness was invented in the United States is um, um, something that maybe is, in is interesting for United States history, but it's not the case. The white identity certainly existed in Barbados uh, before this time and much of the uh, Spanish colonial world. So um, it's a good time, I think, to reflect on the fact that while in the 1980s this project that's getting called Critical Whiteness Studies uh, emerged in the United States, it's now a very vibrant uh, field of inquiry in places like the United Kingdom and actually in Von Ware's work and, and Richard Dyer's work always was a transnational project. And particularly, it's an important project in Australia where indigenous people, Eileen Morton Robinson being one of the leaders, has uh, formed an association called the Australian uh, Association for, the, uh, for Critical Race and Whiteness Studies. Um, and in a really nice illustration of the ways in which the study of whiteness is a project by people, undertaken by people for whom whiteness is a problem. So in many ways, what critical whiteness studies is, if you strip off a lot of academic language, is people trying to come to grips with uh, making whiteness into a problem. So Du Bois said, when was whiteness? He said, why was whiteness? It's very interesting that he uses the term personal whiteness. So he's talking about people not just having a white phenotype. That happened before. 1665, but feeling that they own their whiteness and that their whiteness is an asset, what Cheryl Harris calls whiteness as property. Du Bois was getting at that. Uh, making whiteness into a moral problem, as James Baldwin so fabulously did through all of his writings at one point saying, uh, 
whiteness in the United States is absolutely a moral choice. And then he adds, it's a moral choice made, quote, under a vast amount of coercion. So he makes you realize that there are these structures that make people choose whiteness, but it doesn't let, uh, it shouldn't let us forget that a moral choice is being made when people choose to identify um, as white. An aesthetic problem, whiteness, as the exhibition shows, is an, is an aesthetic uh, problem at, at times. So all that this field, so-called, of critical whiteness studies did in the early 1980s is uh, gather scholars who, for their own, for our own, I was part of it, uh, reasons uh, at that point realized that whiteness was a problem. And the particular reason that we got a hearing, many of us had been working on these issues for a pretty long time, but the reason we got a hearing was that Ronald Reagan had just been elected twice and the first George Bush once, uh, on more or less anti-trade union platforms, um, but with a majority or a near majority of white working people voting for them. And so this moment of what people called the, Reagan, the moment of the Reagan Democrat, in which these white workers decided that to be a white worker meant to be more white than worker, uh, and delivered uh, conservative votes, uh, made it so that in the culture, for lots of people, not just on the left, but also liberals, uh, whiteness was seen as a problem. So suddenly a book like Wages of Whiteness or a better book like Alexander Saxon's The Rise and Fall of the White Republic or Ruth Frankenberg's uh, work on, is that up? Good. Um, so all of that um, got a hearing in a way that it never would before, uh, or really since. Uh, but it, that hearing had a cost. The cost was that the um, pretense was that because these white scholars had begun, George Lipset's Possessive Investment in Whiteness is also right in this period, the article, the books later, um, these white scholars, the fact that white scholars were writing about whiteness made it news. So what got uh, forgotten in all that was that there's this long tradition of writing and thinking, going back really to slave folk tales and uh, American Indian contact narratives, that are critiques of whiteness by people for whom whiteness was a problem, was most a problem, that is, by slaves by indigenous people and then by people trying to get out from under uh, Jim Crow and white supremacy. So it was forgotten that the insights that animate my work, I was trained in black studies, come almost entirely from James Baldwin, Ida B. Wells, Zora Neale Hurston, that tradition of scholarship. And what was also forgotten was that um, even in that moment, of the late 80s and early 90s, the leading work was being done by women of color, particularly Toni Morrison's uh, Playing in the Dark and uh, Cheryl Harris's Whiteness's Property. So you get this uh, emergence of what people were calling whiteness studies. I've always insisted on calling it critical whiteness studies, just so we know. You know, in the United States, the whole universities are kind of whiteness studies. So what, what this is is, cri is critical uh, studies of whiteness. But I just want to tell one story to kind of illustrate um, how this worked at the time and how it still, I think, sort of plagues the field um, in some ways. The New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine uh, decided to do a story about uh, the critical study, what they called it whiteness studies. They, the headline was something like Madonna studies, porn studies, now there's whiteness studies. So all the ridiculous things that nobody would want to study were being thrown together, supposedly, uh, in, this, in this article. And I was interviewed for it, and I asked the reporter if she'd talked to Tony Morrison yet. And Morrison and I were working on a project together at the time, and the reporter said, Tony Morrison? No, that's not news that Toni Morrison would write about race and white people. What's news is 
that white people are, are doing that. And I said, no, that's not really right, and we argued. And she said, okay, I'll try to get in touch with Morrison. The next week, a photographer came out. I was living in Minneapolis at the time. This is quite famous. Uh, photographer of queer life in Minneapolis came out to take pictures for the Times Magazine article, and I knew her a little bit, and she said, you know, it's really strange, the instructions I got for this, and she said, I, they're making me uh, really adjust the exposure in a radical sort of way, and I said, oh, uh, what, what will that do to the pictures, and she said, oh, it'll just make everybody look extremely white. And I thought, oh, so I guess you didn't actually interview Toni Morrison then. And, uh, and they didn't. They just uh, kind of missed. And, and to miss the um, point that this is a branch of ethnic studies in the United States, mostly a branch of African American studies, the critical study of whiteness, is to also miss the ways that it problematizes whiteness in a long tradition of problematizing whiteness. Um, so I, I, I want to just, I think, um, close with a couple points. One is, um, in deference to Sharon's great work on SNCC, that the first time that you actually, and it kind of underlines the point I was making about where critical whiteness studies comes from, the first time that I can tell that um, whiteness was a subject in an academic curriculum in the United States was in Freedom Summer in the Freedom Schools. There were five units in that curriculum, and one and a half were about whiteness. My mentor, Sterling Stuckey, wrote part of that uh, um, curriculum as a then young African-American historian. And I think the, the chapter was, was called, the main chapter was called, What is this white way of life, and why do people want it so badly? And it kind of reminds us that whiteness is a is also a problem in the ways that it enters into people's lives. Um, John Powell, the critical race theorist, lawyer, and I uh, did a questionnaire on whiteness once, and John designed as one of the questions. Um, he asked, when are you white? It was in the, a big oversized literary magazine, and the center spread were these 20 questions that people were actually invited to fill out the answers to and mail in, and 1,500 people responded with these full answers to, to these questions. But John insisted that that when are you white question was also a question for people of color, and it kind of intersects with the um, Hurston quote about colored me at the at the beginning. So this, when are you are you white? And then we had artists and writers intersect with these questions. And he asked Walter Mosley, the taken as black uh, detective writer, biracial uh, detective writer in the United States, to respond to that question, uh, when are you, are you white? So I don't think we're ever talking about just some people uh, when we raise these issues. And I want to just raise one other thing. Um, this is uh, a, a billboard and photograph that um, kind of talks about the American way of life as a white way of life associated with automobility. And I think what's really a genius thing about it is that it raises how um, um, people can forget their own problems in emphasizing this kind of mythical whiteness. Baldwin said, uh, whiteness in the United States is mostly the illusion of safety. It's the illusion that people can live a life without troubles and without dangers. So this was, uh, this photograph was taken as part of a series of the photographers, um, uh, photographs on the 1937 uh, Ohio River flood in, in Louisville, this terrible flood that my mother was actually uh, involved in. And it was very much, these floods in, in the 30s were very much multiracial phenomenon. But the billboard proclaims white safety, and then the reality also proclaims uh, black victimization. Uh, and so it, it kind of merges these images, and we can easily see, I think, the hollowness of the, uh, of the billboard, 
which is kind of a weird billboard and it's kind of an ad for no product really, just for ideology. Um, but uh, it also, the photographer raises the ways in which photographers participate in this myth-making about whiteness and, and safety. Uh, because the, the billboard also um, features an image. So I, I want to close with just one point that grows out of my uh, seeing the wonderful exhibition yesterday. And that's a question that I think we're at a new stage of being able to debate. Most studies of whiteness have assumed that whiteness is invisible. And Peggy McIntosh, is the feminist philosopher, did this great essay called The Invisible Knapsack of White Privilege in which she asked people to uh, list all the things that they get to take for granted because they're considered white. So I will go to rent an apartment, I get turned down to rent it, I don't have to think that was because I was white. I go buy a flesh-colored Band-Aid, it's pretty much my flesh color, I don't have to think about the color of Band-Aids because I'm, I'm white. And the word invisible in that title, the invisible white, knapsack of uh, privilege has been kind of our thought. Uh, and yet, in some ways, and especially from the perspective of people of color, whiteness is very visible and very present. And these photographs that we've seen of the police in Ferguson and really it's about all over the United States recently are often, particularly in the Ferguson one, where the force was so overwhelmingly white, there are these tremendous uh, pictures of the visibility of whiteness. So one of the things, and, and some of the, the triptych, I can't remember the author of the, of the police, the, the artist of the police that's in the show, somebody chat. Which one? Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, this is much, much earlier on, but it's already really raising the image of white visibility, white ability to be invisible when it wants to be invisible, and particularly the role of the, of the police. So one of the things I, I think we might talk about in, the, uh, in your part of the program, the discussion with the audience, is this question of whether whiteness uh, Attain, exercises its power by lurking and being invisible or whether it's also a, a highly visible and a forceful intervention into our lives. So thanks. Thank I'm going to pick up a little bit. I think I'll go here to pick up a little bit on what was happening in Britain in the sense that when David was talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, I think in many ways critical whiteness to this was a transatlantic conversation, certainly the point at which I came into it. So in 1987, when Paul Gilroy wrote There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, he began by quoting Du Bois. And when A. Sivanandan wrote Communities of Resistance in, I think, 1990, 1992. Um, he compared Du Bois's colour line to the poverty line and the power line in the UK with colonialism as the control in the experiment against which resistance was coming and was, was being forged. So, in a sense, I think one of the things that started to happen politically was it seemed as though the UK was following the US. So there was a, a government white paper in 1973 that um, worried that British coloured youth were anxious to follow American coloured youth in their behaviour. And later, when the Scarman Report was written after the Race Relations Act was passed in 1976, that report on the African Caribbean family in the UK recalled, in a way, Daniel P. Moynihan's 1960 report about African American families in the US and that as a tangle of pathology. So, in a sense, that was how it was coming. But 
when I think back, it wasn't that whiteness wasn't being deconstructed. It was that there was really important work to do by people like Sivanandan to get people to think about the shift from racialism in the 1950s to racism. And he used the 1962 Immigration Act as a marker for that. That kind of shift towards understanding what was institutional about racism. And that it was not about people's personal prejudice and that it resided in individuals and not in norms, in whiteness, in public bodies, in, in institutions. Um, and I think maybe just thinking about some of the key cases that occurred. And for some of us, thinking back in our history, I know some of the people here, it will be history. For others of you, it may not. Um, but you know, thinking back to the way in which self-defense was such a dominant issue, um, so the Newham 8, which some of you may remember in 1982, were a group of eight Asian men who were arrested because they had been protecting Asian school children in Newham who were being abused on their way to and from school. And the Newham 8 um, were doing this one day when a car turned up and three white men got out and started abusing the children and they retaliated and they were arrested for a fray. It turned out later that those people were plainclothes police officers. They were not the regular racists that the, the new mate thought that they were. But they still had a trial. Four of them were acquitted. And I think maybe an interesting thing to think about is the white civil rights lawyers. So Michael Mansfield in, in the UK who defended these people, Maurice Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center in the US, whose father was a Klansman, but who turned around and, and, and did that important work. And those people are often very high profile in these cases. But I think the key idea was, you know, these, these young men of 15 to 21 are arrested for doing something which was, in a sense, the only thing they could do which was a form of self-defense. So we were asking important questions that involved whiteness, but not ways of deconstructing it. So, you know, is it the case that um, self-defense is an offense? And how do we understand whiteness through that? And thinking through some of these ideas, I think will remind us as we talk about what's the same today and what's different. Um, thinking about Southall in 1979 and the fact that when the National Front came to town that shopkeepers, residents banded together, shut up shop, um, you know, the anti-Nazi league is there, a community is trying to fend off a neo-Nazi march and when that march is over and Blair Peach is dead, um, killed as a white activist because again this is something that's very similar to issues like Freedom Summer which Dave mentioned in the US sometimes when a white activist is killed an anti-racist activist <coughs> there is more media attention than when other activists from so-called minority groups are killed in the same context Blair Peach's death was an absolute tragedy and it was believed that he had been um, killed by the special patrol or the riot police at the time who, who were lined up with truncheons and weapons and, and trying to protect both sides of the barricades in that context. But, you know, another man was, was hit that day and was in a coma for, for five months, Clarence Baker, I think. I hope his name was Clarence Baker who um, was a, a black man at that march. There are so many hidden histories that interest me. The kind of people who were there behind the people that we know. Mm. And I think maybe some of those will come out, certainly I think in the way that Marquise is thinking about um, some of the people we need to think about. 
So this is the kind of work that Paul Gilroy is doing, and Peter Fryer is telling us about the history of black people in Britain, black and Asian people, over the centuries, from 1984, in his book, tellingly called Staying Power. But the first place I entered with whiteness studies was from Ware's book, Beyond the Pale. And we wanted Fron to be here today, um, and Nottingham Contemporary invited her, and unfortunately, she couldn't be, and we're very sorry, and we send our best um, regards. But from where made a real difference to me. That book made me think. It inspired my PhD, even though her context is transnational and mine was the US South. It made me think about historicizing white women. She brought the histories of individuals to bear. She looked at the paradigm of friendship, which was one that I would think about. So she thought about um, a friendship between two women, Catherine, Ant Catherine Impey, who um, was the editor of an anti-cast and who was castigated by her friend when she proposed marriage to a man of Sri Lankan, then Ceylonese background. And the tensions between the women as a result of having stepped out of line, even in an abolitionist, anti-racist context. So friendship became a real model to me. And I remember reviewing that book for New Foundations in 1992, and I reread it the other day, and I thought, for a book that inspired me, I didn't do a good enough job of making clear, as a kind of younger scholar, just exactly what the paradigms were and the shifts that that book helped us to think about in Britain, because it was transnational. One other thing I wanted to, to talk about is Patricia Williams, because Again, in transnational whiteness studies, she was very important. She came here in 1997. I don't know if any of you remember. She came to deliver the wreath lectures. She was the first black woman in, I guess it was 50 years of history of the wreath lectures at that point. An African-American lawyer, critical race theorist, which bears tremendously on critical whiteness studies. And she came to deliver these lectures, seeing a colorblind future. And she became the subject of media debate. So the Daily Mail, I think, called her um, a radical militant. And you know, the key thing was an African-American woman was coming to the UK to talk about UK race relations. So that's another thing that I think is interesting, is what is our appropriate subject matter? You know, when is it seen to be appropriate to talk about things? Um, Richard King. Um, Emeritus Professor at Nottingham. He and I interviewed um, Patricia Williams after the wreath lectures. And we, we, we took a moment for us to, her to talk to us, you know, to say, we're scholars, we're serious, you know, we've read all your books. Because it was very bruising, I think, to, you know, to have a hard time on um, Radio 4, to be challenged as to why she thought that she could talk about what Stuart Hall said was smoking out the kind of liberal hidden racism, the, li the liberal whiteness that says that racism doesn't exist for me, and I don't see it, I'm colorblind. These were the kinds of things that she was trying to tease out in the transatlantic contest, context. And in the end, I think 98% of people who phoned um, about the reflectors thought they were wonderful. And you know, she had a good time when she was here, I hope but she certainly didn't to begin with. And so I think some of these issues are ones that we might like to think about and take up and think about when, when we're seen to be appropriate, you know, for me to talk about US culture, for you to talk about the UK. It reminds me of once um, being in Virginia, talking about um, Thomas Jefferson, the president of the United States, and the fact that DNA testing, which had been done here in the UK and in Europe and just up the road in Leicester, had given scientific proof to the fact that, um, as African-American oral history had been telling us down the centuries, that Thomas Jefferson had had children with his slave wife, Sally Hemings. And I was there as the lone Briton heckled by David Duke supporters who said, why are you coming here? to talk to us about this. Who are you to talk about this? Because in your parliament, people don't even listen to each other. Why should we listen to you? So in a sense, you know, sometimes these crossover conversations are very much about who has the right, who is seen to have the right to talk about whiteness. 
or blackness. So I think I'll kind of leave it there and maybe move to Marquise to, yeah? Thank you. Could, could Marquise have a little bit of light thrown on the subject? <laughs> Just like we did in Invisibly. <laughs> Uh, open to talk about race, and, and, and I like that. I like that, uh, especially as being a poet and a performer and a person who's going into the field of intercultural communication. Um, I think there are dialogues that need to be had, but a lot of times these dialogues are on, only had uh, in intercultural, intracultural settings, right? So we have dialogues about stuff. Say, for instance, if I, have, if I talk about Ferguson, I talk about it with my black friends, right? But I'm pretty sure that other people are talking about Ferguson, but you talk about it with people that look like you because you don't want to be uncomfortable and you don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, and so, but I think um, when you have intercultural communication and intercultural dialogues, a lot can be gained from those. And so um, I'm going to do some poetry, right? Uh, and I chose this first uh, photo because my mother. Uh, my, grand, my grandparents were share, sharecroppers, and my mother would often tell me, and my uncle would often tell me about stories of growing up in the Deep South, which I'm from, uh, if you can't tell by the accent, um, um, about sharecropping and growing up and picking crops, and them having to pick crops instead of going to school. Uh, and so my mother ended up with like a seventh grade education. And, uh, and for me, it was this system or systematic oppression that was taking place to innocent children that had no way of changing it. And for me, this ideal of innocence, um, sometimes when you think about innocence and when you think about children, you think, okay, children shouldn't have to deal with certain things of this nature. And I'm gonna parallel this into a poem because, so here you see four little girls, right? And one of my the poems that I wrote about the civil rights movement and about just power and also about privilege and how you have to, there were times in the civil rights movement where say for instance, what do you have to think about? What's on your mind today? I have to think about not getting bombed. I have to think about not getting harassed. I have to think about, okay, I know when I, if I participate in this boycott, what is gonna happen to me? And so uh, here you have four little girls in the cotton field, but I'm gonna do a poem about um, the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, right? Also, four little girls talking about innocence and this whole idea of what does it mean to be innocent, what does it mean to be a child. Uh, and I do the poem from the perspective of one of the walls inside the church, and I tell what happens the morning uh, that the 16th Street Baptist Church is bombed. Um, and it was interesting, I was speaking to a group of high school students yesterday in, um, in Oxford, and we were talking, I, I referenced Emmett Till in the poem, and they had never, some of the students had never heard of Emmett Till. And when I told them the story, they was like, are you serious, did that happen? I'm like, yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, it did. And I think like actually money, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I think actually money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was uh, killed was roughly maybe 90 miles away from uh, Arkansas. So it's really, um, it, was, it was a really interesting story, but I'll get into the poem and then I'll come back and I'll speak briefly. So. Um, Ah, I, mm, I don't, as a performance for I don't like to have things in my 
my hands. I'm sorry. So, so do I need to step behind them? I think it's okay. It's okay? Okay, I apologize for being weird. I apologize for Australia. I apologize for Australia. Um, so um, Sundays will never be the same. Abby May, Cynthia, Carol, Denise, we never will forget the last time you stepped foot on our steps and entered our four walls. It was September 15, 1963. Birmingham was a different place then. From our four corners on 16th Street, we watched progress and prejudice meet. We watched stained glass windows. We've seen people march for justice and seen those same people get beaten by police and whipped. We wanted to say something, but church walls don't have lips, just silent bricks. So we did what walls do. We stood up for what we believed in. We opened up our chest to become a refuge on Sunday mornings and weekday evenings. You see, out there, they were praying, but inside us, they prayed. You see, on Sundays, Mondays through Saturdays, blacks were called niggas, but on Sundays, they can come underneath our steeples and all they will be called is God's people. Within us, people could raise their hands in the worship because the police were making them do it. Within us, people could close their eyes and bow their heads and it wasn't because they were hanging from nooses. Every day, we put our big bricks together and prayed, God, help our steeples to be set there. Help our foundations not to falter. I know they're being kicked out there in the streets, but just don't let anyone be sacrificed on our altar. And we didn't. Until that morning. We couldn't quite put our windows on it, but we felt it in our pews. There was something different about this Sunday. The morning air was perfumed with the fragrance of strange fruits. I can still hear the congregation praying. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be our frame. At 1022 church service from Hallelujah to Hiroshima, it felt like the rapture was taking place within our ribcage. We would have stopped the explosions if we could, but all we could do was watch as people started to be baptized in blood. Our stained glass windows shattered like broken promises. Sparks filled the air like fireflies. Outside it was September 15th, but inside our walls it's the 4th of July. Fire works. No fire hurts. God's eye is on the sparrow, but Jim Crow's are circling the church. We wish there were words we could have spoke, but to be and frank, it felt like we had the Holocaust lodged in our throats. But this isn't Germany. This is Birmingham, a town where people simply don't have a problem turning churches into chimneys. Four girls into enemies. Four lives into memories. A church into history. Forty fingers that would never get a chance to hold their firstborns against their chests. Eight eyes that would never get a chance to see their wedding dress. Eight feet that would never get a chance to walk in high heels. Four little girls who now play hide and seek with Emmett Till. We still don't understand how a man can put a bomb in God's house, desecrate our temple that was holy and spiritual, we used to wish we knew what it felt like to be human, but not since the day we miscarried for men. I'm sorry, um, and I'm sorry, um, and and I and I kind of try to do the poem with my eyes closed because for me, um, it's a real, um, really emotional piece, and I, 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 I'm, I. I see the visions and I see the figures in the move um, in the in the actual poem and everything that's taking place and I think I have actually cried while performing that poem and so I think closing my eyes helps me to not um, get so emotional. Have you seen Selma? Selma, right? And, and the first scene in the movie where like the bodies are just the bomb explodes and the bodies are going across the screen like I almost have to walk out the film because I. It was just so um, powerful, but so that's that's uh, that's the first poem. So Sundays will never be the same, right? So and in this ideal of innocence and how kids are caught up in um, uh, situations they shouldn't have to um, be caught up in because you are who you are. Those young girls were bombed in their church 
going to Sunday school because they were black and it was a black church and it was a black establishment. And a lot of times in that day, especially in Alabama, right, if you bombed a church, you, you took out a, 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 a meeting place, you took out a place where it was a spiritual worship was taking place. You also took out a place where people congregated uh, for uh, community events and stuff like that. So if you bombed the church, you bombed and you took out four different event, uh, like the church was an event center. So if you bombed the church, you almost took out a very, very important, well, not almost, you did take out a very, very important part of the community. Uh, and now the next point will fast forward. Uh, if you can go to the slide, slide of Tamar Rice. Um, and so here we go. So once again, now in America, we have this ideal of um, innocence being stolen again. Um, uh, Tamar Rice, a young man who was recently uh, killed and well, gunned down in Ohio, right? And so you have this whole ideal of police, police brutality and uh, power and privilege. And I wrote a poem um, about a mother losing a child um, recently because I have friends and some of my friends who are black women have said to me recently in conversations, and I didn't even ask them about it, but they have said to me that they are afraid to raise a black child or, excuse me, a black male in America. And for me, the, the weight of that statement, it, it, it's, hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to fathom worrying about, you know, you think about some things like, oh, okay, hopefully you make it to school okay, but oh, I hope you're not stopped by the police. I hope that if you are stopped by the police that you don't reach for your wallet too quick. Or it, it, it's, it's, this, it's this dialogue that's playing out in America a lot. And so I wrote a poem um, about just mothers losing their children, uh, and then especially specifically black boys, and how uh, a lot of people feel like that there is this attack or war going on on black boys inside America. And for a lot of people, this is not a problem. You don't have to worry about this. You're not thinking about, if my child gets stopped by the police, what's going to happen? It's not a concern of yours. Because if, you, if your child gets stopped by the police, depending on who you are, hey, they give them their wallet. Hey, you give them your ID, insurance, and you're on your way. And, but that isn't the same story for many people. So um, this poem is entitled, uh, Who Will Save Them? And sorry again, Australia, I apologize. Okay. As the lid of this casket rises toward Her mind is replaying memories, her body slowly rocking back and forth like strange fruit. Pain is Picasso on the canvas of her face. She has his blood-stained dreams in one hand and his obituary in the other. The pastor stands up and he begins to preach the eulogy. He says it's unfortunate that another one of our butterflies had his wings clipped. Said it's unfortunate that another one of our sons has been solely eclipsed because of violence. Every eye in the church is pregnant with tears. Every mouth is filled with silence except for his mother, who keeps repeating the same phrase over and over again. Not my baby. Not my child. She isn't ready to let go yet. She isn't ready to fully accept her son is resting in peace. You see, she isn't ready to fully accept that her choir of gunfire was the last to serenade her baby to sleep. You see, I'm sorry, pause. pause it on. A choir of gunfire was the last to serenade her baby to sleep. You see, he was the one who was supposed to make it past the streets, overcome the odds, managed to elude the evil. He was so full of life, but now his body lays motionless, stiff like a church steeple. He had the potential to soar like a dove, but ended up being vultured by a desert eagle. The choir stood up to sing, his eye is on the sparrow, but no, his eyes were on the barrel. Bullets exited the chamber of the gun and kissed his temple. Hello. Halo. I guess sometimes introductions can be fatal, but it happens so often. Black boys either go from cradles to prisons or cradles to coffins as the lid of his casket lowers. She reaches out for him. But all she can do is hold on to memories now. Memories like his first steps. Memories like the smile he had on his face when she dropped him off on his first day at school. Memories like how he had to exhale his last breath 
out of an exit wound. I'm sick and tired of attending more funerals and graduations. I'm sick and tired of how, ironically, a lot of black boys have the potential to learn calculus, but instead they're often taught trigonometry. Graduation rates stay low like tombstones, but incarceration rates keep rising like skyscrapers. And every time we turn on the news or we open the paper, we see something about another black boy who has the potential to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a scholar, instead graduate to be the next Trayvon Martin, the next face on a t-shirt that we've gone but not forgotten. Black males are only 4 to 6% of the U.S. population, will be close to 40% of those incarcerated. When you look at the numbers, I guess slavery never ended. I guess they only tore down the plantations to make room for the prison. Um, and like I said, um, for me, um, poetry is a mechanism to use uh, storytelling and to share stories from different cultures so that other people can understand what other people go through, right? Simply, uh, simple and plain. And I think a lot of times, since we don't have those intercultural communication or the intercultural dialogues taking place, uh, poetry can be used as a, a way, or performance art in general can be used as a way to help people understand what other people have to go through and what their everyday lives are like. And so uh, um, hopefully you enjoyed the poems. Uh, and if you didn't, thank you for clapping. Uh, now I'm playing, I'm playing, but uh, now I guess we'll have to, to open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, just one of the thoughts that struck me while you were performing was the children and um, the fact that on September 15th, when the four little girls were killed, um, two little boys were killed as well. I don't know if, mm -hmm. yeah. weren't they? Sort of Virgil Ware, age 13, um, riding on his brother's handlebars on his bike, shot by a white Eagle Scout. Um, and uh, Johnny Robinson, who was 15, who, um, who was shot by a police bullet, and people were congregating outside the church and white boys were going past taunting black boys and these black boys, including Johnny Robinson, ran down an alley and a police bullet shot him, shot him dead. And there was talk later that somebody had moved the car and that the foot was on the brake and it had caused the gun to go off. But, you know, these are not unexpected stories in a way yeah. and I wondered whether we ought to say something you know transnationally as well about the fact that Stephen Lawrence's murder clearly etched in our culture and the 18 years that his family spent but you know again behind that story is also another story and many many other stories so um, and I was trying to remember all the names when you were talking so I think and I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I think it was Soit Dugal who was shot, who was killed just before, a few few months before Stephen Lawrence um, in the same area. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Rohit Dugal. Thank you, Jagdish. And, you know, so many other children and so many other names and so many people since Stephen Lawrence's death in 1993. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's, um, I, I think a lot of people are waiting for the names to end, right? But uh, I recently saw a shirt that said um, uh, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, uh, and they had a blank, and it said, uh, to, be, to be filled soon. And then, like, it's the list goes on and on. And, like, when, when that's your perspective or when that's how you think things are going to move forward, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not very optimistic, you know, and so, um, but this is a lot of people, some people's reality, you know, so, so yeah, yeah definitely. I think we knew we were going to have to talk about kind of that institution and, yeah. and I think maybe um, when it's decided that the perpetrator cannot be found or differentiated between other perpetrators or when institutional racism is such that it is a norm that makes invisible 
the things that go on behind that um, that door, then you know that's one of the the ways in which whiteness is unpacked, isn't it? Or that that trap is sprung when we try to think about how it works. I wonder whether, as we kind of become quite sombre now as a result of thinking about the children. Um, and, you know, we had some... We can always return to some of the images that we have, which are about unpacking white supremacy, which is one of the things that we can, can do, um, and unpacking that visually, or some of the other stories about whiteness. But I wonder whether it's, it's time to open up the discussion and see what questions you have for our guests or for me, for any of us, um, if, if you'd like to do that. Yes, sir, over there. Our microphone is, yeah, is on its way to you. If somehow the whiteness and looking at the critique of whiteness gets divorced from power, and if, if there's some way in, in critical whiteness uh, which facilitates almost an invasion of power in this conversation about whiteness, which sort of goes back to, to what's been mentioned already, who is it that does not see whiteness? Well, it's the white people, mainly. And uh, who is this illustration of whiteness for? And if this conversation is about illustrating whiteness and, and white people congratulating each other on they suddenly come to a consciousness of how white they are, um, what's that got to do with actual mm. talk of power and, and, and the way that whiteness deploys itself through power and through politics and could it be an invasion of that? Who would like to go first? Well, um, yeah, I think that's a very important observation and I think... Um, one of the great things about that scene that almost drove you out the theater in Selma is that the bombing of the church is very much shot to look like images from 9-11. And it, it sort of makes us confront white, not only white power, but white terror. And much of what you were talking about was, is not just everyday power, but the power of terrorizing people. So I think that, that one of the things that we have to do, and one of the things that the African American tradition of writing about whiteness has done so well, is to connect whiteness, power, and terror. Emoja Three Rivers, who I quite like as a theorist of uh, whiteness, who is native uh, American Indian uh, and African American, she says whiteness is a, is a political alliance. And I, that quote that you read about whiteness not being a culture, that's sort of what I was, was driving at, that we should always be asking the question, um, you know, whose interests are served by white politics? Whose interests are served by white people thinking that they all have something uh, in common? And what must they do if they believe that that's um, their position in the social order? So. Yeah, I like the question a lot. I wonder whether one of the things there is also to do with multiculturalism in the UK context, that you know, multiculturalism was always about explaining ourselves to each other, but the people who didn't have to explain mm -hmm. themselves were white people. So as we learned about each other's cultures in schools particularly, in institutions, at each other's food, thought about each other's holidays, the people who didn't have to 
explain or question their identity were predominantly white people. And I do think that there are ways in which the kind of political alliance that certainly I felt was working quite well in the 1980s that allied um, African-Caribbean, Asian, white activists has eroded and has, is not working as well as it is. And, you know, why is it that all those groups do not bandy and get behind, you know, something as pathetic and pernicious as Islamophobia? You know, why, you know, isn't, isn't it not, isn't there not a power structure that sort of says actually what you can do is divide and rule? And that's very powerful because if you don't question yourself in the center, then everybody else is a special interest group of some kind, you know, as if it's their appropriate activism mm. to have. And, and therefore that, that falls apart, I think. And I think when Gilroy wrote the, intro, went back to There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack in 2011, and he looked at, and he wrote a new introduction I, I don't remember the words he used right now, but I think that he lamented the kind of loss of that political alliance. That, and I don't mean to make it sound nostalgic or halcyon days, but I think it was quite self-conscious in a way that sometimes I feel we miss losing when people are too scared in a hierarchy of oppression to say, no, I'm Sikh, I'm not Muslim, or you know, don't get me wrong. Um, and they're the kinds of things that also happened after September 11th in the US. You know, when people try to say, it's not me, which always left un unexplained the fact that, it, but it is them. And you know, that's a fundamentalism that I think is dangerous. Gentlemen, over there. Um, this, oh wow. Um, this is just touching on, there's a lot of things you guys have said that's really um, stimulated this question. But um, I was sitting in, a, in, a, in an ethics class um, the other day, and one thing I've noticed is that um, a lot of the time it's because you're not affected by something that you don't question it. So um, we talked about racism, and I just ironically, I was the only um, ethnic minority there, and I understood the... the, the um, the whole problem surrounded racism, which no one else in the, other than the lecture, of course, no one else, none of my peers really understood the problems of racism. Then when we went on to, um, oh, what do you call it work? Um, <coughs> class, class systems, and then I noticed that generally the elitists never really understood the problems of um, the middle and the working class, and it just went vice versa. So this is more to you, because... Um, clearly you actually understand this and a lot of the people here in the room. How was it that you were able to sort of understand the problems and um, this is just so that to get a better understanding with people who don't, a means of being able to touch um, on how they, to sort of teach them or so we can enter that dialogue um, to show how, the, the problems within it. Well, um, and I, I've definitely been there before where you are the only ethnic minority in the class. Um, and, and sometimes it's something that until you've been in that point, you don't really think about, right? So um, I remember when I was getting my bachelor's degree, and I, I think the college was 3% other, so it was like 97% white and 3% other. And so oftentimes you would be in class, and it was like, OK, so, huh, so black people, hmm. And it's like, whoa, like, and so now I'm ask, answering for the whole race, right? And it's like, oh, God, don't let me get it wrong. But um, I, it, it's interesting, it's interesting that, um, say, for instance, if it's an African-American studies program or African-American studies class, the class we predominantly African-American, or if it's, say, for instance, a uh, women's rights class, what I found is the class would be predominantly women, right? And so oftentimes, people who don't um, associate with a culture or feel like they're not a part of a culture don't really go out of their way to learn about other cultures outside of their own, right? And so I think for me, is trying to figure out ways that you can get them information about those other cultures um, because a lot of times we aren't going to seek that. And so I think performance is one of those ways, uh, say, for instance, theater, uh, all the performance arts are, I think, um, ways that we can do that. Uh, theater, comedy, I love com comedians because they are able to talk about the toughest issues 
and have everybody laugh about it, but then like, oh, but it's true, you know? So it's like one of those things where uh, the performance arts allow us to do that, but it's, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to get people outside of their comfort zones and learn to learn about cultures outside of their own. And I, I don't know if there's just human nature or, or, or what it is, but I, I, definitely, I definitely can, um, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say, I definitely can feel where you're coming from. Um, and and it's, it's something I still grapple with, but that's one of the reasons why I think I have started um, writing more poetry about social issues and cultural issues so I can push the button and press the envelope and like, let's have a dialogue about this. Um, I started a, a, a poetry um, project called Your Voice Matters, and one of the first poems I had students write were from the Asian American's perspective of growing up as Asian American in the South. And it was amazing. The students start talking about, well, my name's not Jackie Chan. And it, 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 they start talking about all these things that nobody else had ever known they felt. And it was like, wow, this is amazing. But like, how do we get more of that? How do we get more of that dialogue in between cultures? How do we get to a point where we are having people learn about cultures outside of themselves? Uh, and I'm, I'm still grappling with that, but I think you know, performance art is definitely one of, the, one of those ways that we can do that. And I hope I answered your question. I got gotcha, got gotcha. okay, right on. <clears throat> so you, so you're gonna say something? No, I was, but no, I, no, I'd okay. rather sure, you I did. No, please so, go ahead. Okay, well, fine. A um, couple of things, actually, I'm a bit puzzled about. Um, there was a statement made earlier on about that in this country we are quite happy to talk about race in comparison with the United States. No, I, I, from my from from my experience, which has only been two yeah, weeks. No, 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 no,
Anyway, that's enough. Thanks. Um, in terms of Obama, um, well, I mean, there's there's so much there, isn't there? There's, you know, is he black enough? The birth certificate? Is he American enough? Is he a um, Muslim? Is he a Muslim? Which shouldn't that, anyway? Uh, is he not African American but yeah. but black? And you know, he's mixed race. And no, I don't think he was ever going to get it right in terms of all those um, mm. definitions. But. Um, I think that things are changing and they're moving because he's gone through so many different peaks and troughs and race keeps coming back. You know, you, you, you can't have a race blind campaign, there's no post-racialism. Yeah. So, you know, every time somebody posits that there is, then race keeps coming back and another, um, and it hits him again because he's expected to, to comment on race over yeah. other things. Quick comment. Um, I, when Obama was elected president uh, the first time, I, I was uh, working in a predominantly, uh, it was half black, half white office. The election happened. The next day at work, nobody talked about the election. Nobody talked about Obama being elected president. Nobody, it was like, so nobody saw, nobody's watching the news, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, Fast forward to, say, for instance, when Ferguson happened. And it's on every news station. It's like it's on 24 hours. Nope. Nobody's going to talk about it at work. Nope. And, and nobody even was like, hey, Marquise, what do you think? You know, like no, nobody said anything. So, um, but then, okay, to go to Obama, I think I, I've heard the statement that Obama could not win because he would never be black enough and then he would never be white enough. Mm -hmm. And so it was one of those things where, People were like, well, he's not doing enough for the black people. Well, he has to be the president for the United States. And then some people say, for instance, with the initiative, initiative that he did for the historically black colleges, uh, oh, he's trying to help out the black people. It was like, he, it, it, it was, it's just a hard situation to be in. But I think one thing I like about him is just he's focused on trying to be the best president of the United States that he can be. You know, And at the end of the day, I think that's all he can be. And there are some things that you can't change. You know, He's a black man. And so automatically there are assumptions um, and things that he's gonna, people are gonna perceive him in a different light. If you, if you're a black man and you do something for the historically black colleges, it's because you're black, you know. And so it's one of those things where, uh, you know, you just kind of let perceptions be what it is, and you just have to kind of do the best that you can to move forward, you know. Um, I think that's just it. Right? That's, that's all it can be. Yeah. Thank you. I think we've got room for a couple more questions because what we thought we would then do is all move towards the. Cafe, the bar, yeah, and and take up, but but certainly we should. Oh, is it oh. closed? Oh no, Jana. Oh, okay. But we certainly want to hear <laughs> people who have things they want to. That segued me away from <laughs> wherever the, the cafe is. But um, if if you have questions, then please please ask them on any topic. Yes. Um. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We don't think your we don't think your microphone's working. My my own encounter with my own whiteness was as someone who wrote about popular music in the nineteen eighties. And as a white a working class white boy who's enthralled to black culture, you, you occupy this very kind of strange territory of sort of privilege which you want to kind of disavow. And, and, you know, blackness something to be aspired to, and yet you're, you're very wary of your own aspirations because you're aware that that is a kind of um, tourism. And at that time in the 80s, when I first became aware of it, I wasn't in the campuses, so I was really interested to see what, hear what David was saying. But I was involved with popular culture, and um, there were these bizarre novels written by James Elroy, kind of white jazz, where he was, you know, he's really kind of... Um, trying to perform a certain kind of version of whiteness. And there was Don DeLalo's White Noise, which was this, this, this kind of um, something similar, but, but, but done in that context. Um, and what I was curious about with those is there's something quite vaudevillian about whiteness when it's performed. There's something quite kind of 
ugh, somewhere between monstrous and camp about it. Um, so I'm just not sure about this this idea that the that whiteness is is kind of hidden and, and normalised. I mean, at the same time, it's like there was the Andros Sereno exhibition with with the Klansman, where he, he just did those those photographs of Klansmen. Again, something quite kind of performative and, and, and quite kind of theatrical about it. I just wondered if you had any thoughts, any of you about that. There's a clan image in the show upstairs, um, which is, you, you know, this one? Uh, yeah, 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 which I think is kind of gets at some of these contradictions. It's a, a tremendously um, in people's face clan. It is the clan, uh, which was, uh, you know, hidden. Uh, the individual clansman was always hidden, but the social role and visibility of the clan. Uh, and the pageantry of the Klan was designed to be maximally present and, and visible. So I think you get this kind of, uh, that it's dangerous to think of whiteness as an invisible. I, somebody, I mean, I think the first comment suggested maybe unspoken is a better word than invisible. Whiteness doesn't often have to speak its name uh, in order to take a position but I don't think it's really necessarily invisible much of the time. I guess these images, and um, Philip Guston's here, made it very visible. So when he started um, painting murals, I think, certainly Klan supporters destroyed one of them. You know, this is a, a figurative painting instead, but you know, there are a number of interesting things. One is that, you know, this, this is um, raced, but not gendered. And, you know, one of the things that I found um, most disturbing, I think, um, at different points in, in museums in the South was seeing the Klan costumes for, costumes for children oh. and the Klan mm -hmm. pictures of women. Yeah. And, you know, something, I think, to think about the screaming mobs that were women. And, you know, otherwise, if we're not <laughs> careful, we have this assumption that white supremacy is male and that it's automatically gendered male in the way that, you know, this image in a crass vaudevillian way um, makes clear from these police officers that, you know, performing their whiteness for Danny Lyon's camera. Um, and so I think that, you know, maybe it's also about what is appropriate for art and, and maybe novelists, you know, from Edgar Allan Poe Herman Melville Om have been exploring whiteness in really quite brave and courageous and imaginative ways and spinning off from whiteness. And when you look back at the um, Guston, it's, it's almost like it's more difficult, you know, is this the appropriate subject for art, you know, in the visual culture? So I think it makes us think about those things which are interesting, um, but also disturbing. A little, a little bit, louder. Not, not as loudly as we'd like, if... Um, Thank you, Miss. Um, my question is about um, media. Um, I'm kind of curious about the fact that we discuss um, whiteness without discussing media. Mm. Uh, ben Hook, for example, is like the term of white supremacy. And I, I, I wonder what happens when we Anybody like to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, I think white supremacist patriarchy always used women, and you know white women were the pretext for lynching. They were <coughs> used, and it took black women and white women coming together. Ida B. Wells, Jesse Daniel Ames. It took 
women coming together to recognize the way in which white patriarchal formulations that had sexualized black women and desexualized white women um, made white women responsible for white mob violence or for patriarchal, sh patriarchal chivalry, you know, a kind of chivalry or, um, that would go and protect white women. So in white supremacy, it was incredibly, incredibly important patriarchy because that's kind of what it rested on. You were talking about the Emmett Till trial, weren't you? Yeah. And Yeah, I, I think they're inseparable. I, I think I think you you can't talk about one um, uh, without the other, and even with the, the uh, like you say with the chivalry, and so with the Emmett Till case, he whistles at the woman, so they say she, her husband's on, away on business. He comes back, ah, you disrespected my wife, and so now here you go, and so now it's this chivalry into protect my wife, and you know, and all white women in the South. Uh, we go and we kill Emmett Till. And so I don't think you can talk about uh, one without the other. And I think there's just one incident, but I think they go hand in hand. Mm. Yeah. Carolyn Bryant, in a sense, had to live with that circumstance yeah. of her husband believing that the 14-year-old boy had come down from Chicago and maybe, maybe Wolf whistled yeah. or behaved in a fresh way yeah. towards her. You know, and we will never know exactly what went on in that shop when she was behind the counter and he was buying his gum. We will not know that, really. But what we do know is that she was the pretext for everything that happened to him after that. And so I think patriarchy is there in everything we're saying, but you're mm -hmm. right to kind of surface the way in which women are contained and controlled within white supremacist structures when you think about what segregation was like as an expectation to live under, I think. It was, it was incredibly important that women, white and black, knew the role that they had to play within that society in order for that fiction of white supremacy to work, I think. Yeah. We've got, we've got, <laughs> car in the United States. My father owned one. That officer, the police officer, with his back to us, that's Bull Connor. I was wow. seated in the, in the car with my father and three other adults, and we were challenged by those five or six policemen, told to get out of the car, insulted, threatened with a, a weapon, and all because we were visitors. We came from the north. Mm -hmm. We traveled overnight because there was nowhere to stay. Black people couldn't stop on the highway. Yeah. We had to pass all the motels, hotels, restaurants. We had to carry our own food to feed ourselves. You know what I'm talking about, brother. Yeah, yeah. We talked and, about this earlier. So yeah. I just want to point out that we're not just looking at an image. We're looking at recent history. Yeah. That's yeah. my history. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seated in that car. Those policemen threatened us. And, we, and I, as a 14-year-old boy, was frightened and didn't know what to do. Did, my father didn't know what to do because he was challenged in front of his children. Yeah. yeah. And there was nothing he could say. Yeah. He was powerless. Yeah. Yeah. And I think... Um, what you're saying speaks to, like my uncle, when I talked to him about the civil rights movement, especially in Little Rock, my uncle was, like my father, is a quiet man. But when I asked him about the civil rights movement, I've never seen so much cussing. And so like he, beca he became alive and he almost teared up because of the, the history that he had to relive and the images that were replayed over and over in his mind. And so I think, like you said, for some people, when they see that picture, it's just a picture. But for some people, that's your, some people that's history and then for other people that's your living history. Like you, you remember that and it's a part of you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. There's also a sense, I think, where the, the fineness of the car becomes part of the violence of the police. A lot of lynchings, a lot of acts of terror were directed against people. I used to teach at University of Missouri, which is the only campus to have a lynching. And it was a lynching of someone who had the nicest car, black or white, in the uh, city of Columbia, Missouri. And so that was seen as an affront to white supremacy. So it's, it's actually the success that becomes the affront. And I think that 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for contributing that. We've, we have. Yeah, it's amazing. Two questions towards the back there. I must say, you've got to get right into the middle. <laughs> Um, my point was responding to the question over there about uh, gender particularly. So, like, I think you outlined maybe, like, a white female position, but not necessarily a woman of colour's position. So I was uh, especially interested in, Marquise, when you were talking about, uh, like, the current situation in America, and you specified that your friends in America, when you talked to them, they were saying that they were scared of raising a black male in society, but... I was interested in why you specified black male, considering that there have been maybe not as considerable a number, but still a considerable yeah. number of black women in America that have been shot by police. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> and, and it's very important because a lot of my uh, black female friends are often upset about, say for instance, the, the lack of coverage that does take place over these black shootings, right? Especially black women. Um, and so I, spo I, I spoke to that and I, I had the poem because, um, Pretty much, that's what the media often plays. That's what the media often plays. If you see uh, a black woman get shot, it doesn't make news coverage, but it does take place. Um, and so, um, I really was just speaking towards the fact that no, none of my none of my friends have expressed fear over raising a black a black daughter in America. Not to say that there isn't fear, because I think every person, no matter where you live has to deal with something, and you're dealing with something on a regular basis. And a lot of times, people, the only people who understand what you're dealing with are people who are in a similar situation. And so um, I wasn't trying to skip over or say that it wasn't taking place, because it does take place, and it has been taking place, maybe not as at a, a, a higher rate, but nonetheless, I don't think you can say just because it hasn't taken place at a higher rate that you can belittle, belittle it and skip over it or whatnot. So yeah, so I, I definitely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. If I can just, sorry. Uh, yeah, but I think you're in a position where, although your friends may not have personally reflected it, like you could, like as you said, the media isn't covering the shooting of female women of colour in America as much as they are males. So I think you're in a position where you could raise that as something as well. So I think yeah. that's something that maybe you could voice alongside your poetry and like raise awareness of it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. There's also a, a gender dimension to the resistance that I think gets lost um, sometimes. Uh, Black Lives Matter was very much a, a, the creation of uh, young queer black women. And uh, in St. Louis and in the local places, everyone knows that. I don't think necessarily as the story travels and as the media portrays it, that that travels. And in the Mike Brown case in Ferguson, the uh, kind of original two days of protest were black mothers who uh, kind of sat vigil first with the body and then uh, to make sure that it wasn't forgotten. So what sometimes seems like a movement entirely of young people and mostly male uh, actually has a lot of different dimensions that are lost in the shuffle. Can I just say, we had a study session the other day, and one of the things we were thinking about was open letters, you know, about race and rights, and thinking about the letters that the mothers of dead boys had sent to each other in support. And, you know, reading some of those, if, if we'd have got to them in, in everything that we did. And, you know, I think your question is, is well put, but it's also about the fact, it's what Jan said at the beginning, that this is kind of one of many events. And, you know, I'd like us all to sit here for two days and thrash it out. But it's not going to happen because she won't let me. And, <laughs> you know, from that point of view, I think these, we, it's an idea for a poem. It's important. But I, I do get the feeling that we are inevitably going to be taking sort of small ideas, positions, snapshots, and you know, I'm conscious of that. We're not always opening up things in the complexity that we'd like to if we had longer. Yeah. Um. Um, I've got a question for Marquise, really. Um, I noticed um, in both the poems you read, you made a reference to Strange Fruit. Yes. Um, I don't know if it was intentional, but I immediately thought of Billie Holiday there, and, yeah. and how um, frequently so much 
African American music, or at least music that's derived from an African American tradition. Yeah. Earlier, like rap, and then later, kind of, uh, sorry, jazz, and then later, um, R&B, hip hop, and um, their kind of musical children um, is very self-consciously African American, and it has a role in kind of speaking some painful truths mm. about race relations in a way that a lot of other outlets can't really. Um, and then in, in light of the comments made about the unspokenness of, of whiteness, I wonder, if, is there a role, do you feel that there's a role of white music to speak out against the unspokenness of, of whiteness and, and dwelling on some of the insights brought forward through, uh, through critical whiteness studies, if, if, if white music, if there is such a thing, can be mm. held responsible for not being critical or self-conscious enough? Wow. Um, very good question. Um, I think, um, I think there's, um, I think there's space for all music to be able to enlighten people about things that we are unaware of or we choose not to look at, right? I think that was one of the greatest things about, say, for instance, early hip hop and NWA and uh, Public Enemy and uh, you listen to some of those earlier albums and it put out in the forefront everything that was going on in the neighborhoods, all the oppression, all the police brutality, so forth and so on. So I think there's space for, um, I think there's space for that still, whether it's white artists, whether it be Eminem or whether it be uh, 2 chains, you know, so, you know, a black artist. So I think there's space for that. And I think it, ne um, I think it needs, I think it needs to be there because I think as hip hop moved along and it got more commercialized, it, it became less about speaking uh, about stories in the community and more about how can I sell more records? How can I have more bling and stuff like that? And so I think the commercialization of hip hop as an art form and as, as a music uh, kind of took those stories away from the community. But I think uh, definitely there's space for um, music to still speak uh, truth to power and talk about those things that need to be talked about within the community. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot of space there, especially now. I think there have always been racial crossovers in music that are really interesting. And I'm trying to remember, Rose may be able to tell me, it's either in the movie Boycott, which won an NAACP Image Award in 2000, or it may be the Rosa Parks story. There's a wonderful scene where Mrs. Parks is going on the bus and they use Leonard Skinner's Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> Um, a song that, you know, had a contro controversial discussion around George Wallace, around, you know, whether that was a white supremacist song. And, and what they do is they, I'm never good at this, they hip hop it, <laughs> right? So they change it. Rose is laughing at me now. They change it, they use the music and it becomes something completely different. It's the same song, but it has been completely changed in the movie. And the movie, the music is anachronistic because obviously, you know, it's way after yeah. the Montgomery bus boycott. But I think those racial crossovers are are really interesting in music. Um, hi, um, just kind of in relation to that, um, I, Marquise, I completely agree with what you said about art and particularly performance art. Um, being the medium to kind of initiate interest and then go forth and invigorate change, um, particularly with artists, particularly in the UK at the moment with um, George the Poet and his um, yeah, okay. spoken word. I think he's able to bring kind of um, the working class um, black background, particularly with a Cambridge education, he's able to kind of sit at the table with people who will take notice. Um, However, I recently um, undertook a project whereby I combined pictures from um, the recent um, Baltimore protests and also um, pictures from the Brixton race riots mm -hmm. in the UK. Yeah. Um, and I s put them together in relation to um, quotations from Linton Kwesi Johnson. And it seemed to me that um, everything that was happening, those images could have been from either situation. So they were kind of crossing cultural boundaries, cross crossing geographical boundaries, but also temporal boundaries. Mm. And it seemed to me that where performance poetry and performance art has always happened, and I also, and I always think that's the most important thing to initiate that interest to start with, yeah. where can art go and where can that performance go to make change happen that has tried to happen before, but it's never quite been solidified. Mm -hmm. 
so so um and I went to Brixton uh when I was in London, right? And so people were like, Oh, you went to Brixton? Like, it's dangerous. Like, I felt at home. Like, you know, so that's it, it was interesting. But um, especially say for instance with performance poetry. So um slam poetry, relatively a new art form, came out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I think when it comes to slam poetry or spoken word poetry, it's still in its infant stages, right? And so I think a lot of artists are trying to figure out where can it go next? It's been in the coffee house, uh, it's been on a few college stages, but I think artists are trying to figure out where can it go next? And, um, and I think the sky's the limit, right? Because I think one thing that slam poetry does is, is say for instance, it's, it's like you said, George DePoor. So he has a Cambridge education, right? So he's probably like me, when I go to start my PhD program in the fall, I know I'm gonna be the only black person in the program. And, but I know I'm breaking racial boundaries, I'm break, breaking class boundaries. It's a lot of boundaries that, uh, and uh, things that I'm breaking when I enter that. And I think that's what slam poetry does. And I think that's what performance poetry has the ability to do. It has the ability to bring people together from different backgrounds and different paths, right? Because poetry historically been, when I talk to high school students and middle school students, I'm like, hey, we're gonna learn about poetry. Like, what? <laughs> I wanna learn about that stuff? Shakespeare and you no know, henceforth and forevermore. Like, we don't talk like that. And so, but when I, expose them to slam and when I expose them to performance sports and spoken word, it's like, I can actually see myself in that space now. And now it's like, oh, okay, so um, that's the power of it. And I think, um, say for instance, uh, Kate Tempest, has anybody heard of Kate Tempest? Right, oh wow. So she did this, uh, recently she did a, a thing called the, the Ancient, the New Ancients, and where she performed poetry with the orchestra and they had visual art in the background. And so for me, that's where the evolution comes in, where you can merge these art forms together and you can break down these barriers, right? Because say for instance now, people historically speaking in the United States, if you go to the orchestra, you're all white people, right? And so it's like, but now say for instance, if you have a black poet, George the poet, and he does what Kate Tippett does, so now you're breaking barriers within the art form and you're bringing people together from different socioeconomic classes, different races, and it's like, the, the possibilities are limitless. And, uh, and that's why I'm really excited about it because it, I'm not saying, I do believe art can change the world. Now, will you change everything? No, but I think you definitely can make a, uh, a significant impact. And so, yeah. yeah. I think that's a great place to, to stop, to pause, and to where can art go and can art change the world? And we've been thinking about the ways in which the world hasn't changed, but we've also been thinking the ways in which it might. So thank you all for your questions tonight.